this is an international problem. And we can come home, or largely come home, and use NATO. This is an international problem. We caught ISIS. We did Europe a big favor. Uh, we got 100 percent of the caliphate. We have thousands and thousands of ISIS fighters are killed, and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, are in prison right now. And Europe doesn't want them. It's not right. They want to go to France. They want to go to Germany. They want to go to UK. They want to go to these countries where they came from. That's where they, that's their home. The U.S. is not their home. They want to go. It's not fair that we're holding these people and that other countries aren't taken because we're bearing the cost. So I think that NATO should be expanded and we should include the Middle East. Absolutely. And we pay for a big percentage of NATO. And by the way, if you look at and speak to Secretary General Stoltenberg, who's doing a terrific job, by the way, uh, he will tell you that I raised $130 billion more than they were getting. It was going down from past administrations every single year. It was down to a very low number. I came in. I said, got to pay, folks. Got to pay. We're working with you. We're protecting you. We're a part of this. You got to pay. We don't want to be the fools like we have been for so many years. So we raised $130 billion almost immediately. We had a meeting with all of the countries. I said, you got to pay. I mean, I can imagine they don't like me as much as Obama and other people, but I got to pay. We're protecting you. Got to pay. We got 130 billion more, more, not 130, 130 more. In fact, my biggest fan in the whole world is Secretary General Stoltenberg, because he can't believe it. And now he just announced 530 billion dollars we've gotten under my watch, and so we're in great shape with with that whole situation. And I think uh, NATO should be helping us now with the Middle East. Having an international flavor there is good. Plus, you had a deal signed with many of these countries that are in NATO. So, you know, the economic deal with Iran. So I have actually, uh, I have actually said that I think the scope of NATO should be increased, and they should be looking for ISIS, will help. But right now, the burden's on us, and that's not been fair. But we've done a great job with ISIS. When I came in three years ago, ISIS was all over the place. It was a disaster. And now ISIS is — the caliphate, 100 percent of the caliphate is gone, 100 percent. And we have tens of thousands of prisoners. Well, we have them in prison. But they should be taken, and Europe should be helping with that burden. But I like the idea of NATO expanding their views. So, since, since the environment is part of the issue we're talking about today, so, uh, since the environment is something that is on the uh, table here today, uh, what, what is your position on global warming? Do you think it's a hoax? Do you no, think it's no, not global? at all. Nothing's a hoax. Nothing's a hoax about that. It's a very serious subject. I want clean air. I want clean water. I want the cleanest air. I want the cleanest water. Uh, the environment's very important to me. Somebody wrote a book that I'm an environmentalist. It actually called the environmentalist. Actually, before I did this, but they wrote a book. I'd like to get it. I have it in the other office. So I'll bring it to my next news conference, perhaps. I'm sure you'll be thrilled to see it. I'm sure you'll report all about it. But, no, I'm a big believer in that word, the environment. I'm a big believer. But I want clean air. I want clean water. And I also want jobs, though. I want — I don't want to close up our industry because somebody said, you know, you have to go with wind or you have to go with something else that's not going to be able to have the capacity to do what we have to do. We have the best employment numbers we've ever had. We have the best unemployment numbers we've ever had. So that's very important. All right, one more. How much of your own money are you prepared to spend on your re-election? Re I, I literally haven't even thought about it. Uh, I spent a lot on the first one, and I said I did the primaries, and obviously that came out to be very successful. And uh, I have not thought about it. I will say this, uh, because of the impeachment hoax, we're taking in numbers that nobody ever expected. You saw the kind of numbers we're reporting. We're blowing everybody away. We've never — nobody's ever taken in the money that we're taking in from the public. And uh, it's good because it's an investment they're making. They're making that investment. It's better than the big donors. We're taking in uh, — we're taking in numbers that nobody has ever seen before, frankly. And it's a great thing. — 2016 by saying that you wouldn't take donor money. — Well, I don't know. I put in a lot. Do you know the number that I put in? Do you know the number I invest — I put in for the uh, primaries and for the first election? What? Do you know that number? — It's a big off. number. Uh, and I, I, to this day, say, I wonder if it mattered, because I never noticed myself getting any credit for that. I did. I spent a lot of my own money. Uh, 
you know, tens of millions of dollars, times a lot. But I spent a lot of my own money. And I always asked the question, I said, I wonder if it was necessary, because I don't think anybody even knew that I was spending it. I'd mention it every once in a while, but I don't know. For instance, I give up my salary. It's 450000 approximately 450000 presidential salary. I give it up. It goes to — usually, I give it to drugs. I give some to Elaine sometimes for transportation. But every quarter — I think it's paid on a quarterly basis — I give up 100 percent of my salary that I make as president. I don't think anybody's written that story. You guys don't want to write that kind of a story, but that's okay with me. Listen, I'm going to Ohio. Some of you are coming with me, and we look forward to it. I want to congratulate all of you, because I think this is going to make a tremendous difference in your unions and in your — for your workers and for your investments and for everything. This is going to be a fantastic thing. We'll bring numbers down from 20 years to less than two. We'll bring them down from 10 years. I really think that you'll hit much less than two, even for major projects. And I want to thank everybody for being here. It's a great honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have been listening to President Donald Trump coming to us from the White House, and it bears repeating exactly why he was speaking at all. It was actually because of revisions being made in the National Environmental Policy Act. These are revisions that are supposed to make it more possible more quickly to have infrastructure pro projects. And that's why we saw behind the president a number of construction workers. That was why he was there. But actually, most of what he had to say had to do with Iran and, of course, the strikes against the General Soleimani and then the retaliation by Iran in turn. We're going to turn now to our chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Cirilli. So, Kevin, I noticed what the president said was, number one, we're going to have sanctions against Iran increased immediately, according to him. Also, he'd like NATO troops, actually, to replace some U.S. troops in the region. Precisely. And in fact, the president saying that those sanctions has already been implemented and that Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin sometime within the next 24 hours will announce them formally in some type of statement. The president saying that those sanctions are coupled with already sanctions that are already in place. You mentioned NATO, the president praising the head of NATO, Stauffenberg, as it relates to him trying to build an international coalition to help, quite frankly, I'm told, take some of the geopolitical pressure off of the United States states and to spread it around to U.S. allies in NATO, including uh, European allies, where a top State Department official is headed within the next week. Beyond that, the president also uh, making comment regarding uh, that Ukraine flight that was shot down, reportedly, according to CBS News, uh, by Tehran. The president speculating openly about how he feels that flight had gone down. Uh, he said that it was, quote unquote, flying in a dangerous neighborhood. Either way, it's just further adding to the intrigue about that particular flight, David. Yeah, it was striking. The president specifically said he does not believe it was mechanical failure. He said he didn't want to go into why he thought it was, but he didn't think it was mechanical failure. And it's quite a turnaround, actually, with Jens Stoltenberg. Remember their early meetings that were fairly testy. At the same time, the president had some things to say that I think will be controversial, such as claiming that the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, actually has defended General Soleimani. I suspect that will not go down well in some quarters. No, I don't think it will either. And in fact, when I've been talking with Democrats within the past couple of days, all of them have, uh, I haven't found one Democrat who suggests that uh, Soleimani was a good actor. They've all described him as a bad actor. He also took aim at uh, Utah Senator uh, Mike Lee, a member of his own party, Senator Mike Lee, joining Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, another Republican. Both of them have been critical of the president in terms of how he has bypassed Congress for his military approach. The president saying uh, that the, that the, uh, information that those two senators wanted uh, is up to the military to release. He also suggested that maybe he would be willing or the military might be willing to share that information one on one with those lawmakers. He, I, I was struck by President Trump saying, quote unquote, I've never seen him like this, referring to Senator Mike Lee. I've never heard the president refer to a key ally of his in that regard. Either way, this legislation making its way in the House and the Senate uh, is all but yeah. virtually not going to ever become into law. The math isn't there in the Republican controlled Senate, David. Yeah, and as you know, Kevin, on the other side, Senator Mike Lee saying he'd never seen a briefing like that. He thought it was just yeah. ridiculous. He was very outspoken <laughs> on the question. So there's yeah. a lot going on up there. Thanks so much to Kevin's really reporting from the White House. And now we go to Sean Donnan in Washington on trade issues, because the president also talked about trade, talking about the phase one deal that's supposed to be signed next week with Lou Her when he visits Washington, but also saying phase two negotiations should start immediately, Sean. What are we looking forward to? 
Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, the Chinese overnight finally confirming what the president tweeted out last week, and that, that is that they will be here in Washington January 15th to sign that phase one agreement. Liu He, the vice premier, coming over. The president today saying that was a significant percentage of the overall deal. Uh, this is a, a deal, of course, that leaves out a lot of the harder issues uh, that uh, the administration initially was hoping to tackle in its negotiations uh, with China but does include a whole lot of uh, farm purchases and, and other purchases of American exports. Uh, what's interesting about what the president said about phase two uh, right there is that while he said negotiations would start right away, he said he didn't think an actual phase two deal would come until after the November election. Uh, as recently as a few weeks ago, uh, he was saying via Twitter that he thought he may even be heading on a plane to China later this year uh, to close a phase two. So yeah. a lot of questions about what comes next. Exactly. Here. On the one hand, I expect it to start right away. Don't expect anything to get done anytime soon. It may be after the election. At the same time, we still don't know what's in those 86 pages, do we, in the phase one? Well, we know uh, the you know the administration has briefed out the the outlines of, of what's in there. We know there are some commitments on intellectual property. Uh, we know that there will be some lines on currency. Uh, we obviously know that there is this big commitment on on purchases. There, uh, the administration is starting to circulate a text. We're told that uh, uh, folks up on Capitol Hill are starting to uh, have a look at it in in secure areas, uh, and we should see it uh, finally released. Uh, a week from now after uh, after the signing and we will all be diving into that text to see just how much substance uh, there is to this agreement but the big important point here is will China live up to its promises and oh. secondly uh, will they ever have a uh, phase two uh, yeah. agreement that would deal with some of the more prickly issues two big questions no question about it thank you so much to Sean Donna reporting from Washington and now it's high time we got to check on the markets Abigail Doolittle is here and it looks kind of like a risk on day it's Certainly a risk on day. It really feels like the fourth quarter of 2019, that big rally that we saw in that final quarter of the last year where there was day after day of record high. That's what we're here having once again, record highs right across the board here. What really stands out, David, uh, the fact that the emerging markets today having their best day since September, that's a further out part of the risk continuum. So it tells you just how willing investors are to stretch for yield, for risk, bonds trading lower. And here in the U.S., what's leading us higher, once again, technology. We have tech at another all-time high. Apple, the biggest point boost there, another all-time high there. Jefferies raising their uh, price target, saying that the holiday season was pretty strong. Chip strong, AMD on fire. So again, just a theme uh, that we have been seeing over the last few months, a little bit of a, a ripple in the first couple of days of 2020, but 2019 or 2020 right now, taking its cues from 2019, yeah, but so. that earnings season coming up. Let's see oh, what happens. Oh, yeah. Then we'll have to check how much they actually made. Okay. Thank yes. you so much to Abigail Doolittle. And now we're going to turn next to a talk with Senator Tom Carper of Delaware. We're going to talk with him about what he thought about that secret administrative briefing yesterday on the U.S. attack on General Soleimani. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Congress has been demanding an administrative briefing on President Trump's decision to attack General Soleimani last week. And yesterday they got that briefing, but some senators, including some Republicans, such as Mike Lee and Rand Paul, were far from satisfied. Welcome now a member of the Senate Homeland Security Committee. He's Senator Tom Carper, Democrat of Delaware. He's coming to us from Capitol Hill. So, Senator, you were at the briefing. Were you as dissatisfied as what we heard from Senator Lee and Senator Paul? You know, one of the things that I, I found uh, troubling was the reinvention of, of, of history, revising history. And one of the things that the Secretary of State said is that the, the Iranians had indicated no interest in, for 40 years, in the diplomacy and negotiating on, on anything of any consequence. And as it turns out, uh, I thought to myself, you know, I thought we negotiated five years ago uh, a, a deal on uh, nuclear weapons. And Iran is a very big part of that uh, negotiation. Uh, Rouhani was for it. Uh, Zarif was the foreign minister, very much a part of that. The guy, one of the guys who's most in Iran, who's most against uh, the, uh, the, the deal to take away nuclear weapons from Iran, was Soleimani, believe it or not. The, uh, the, the uh, uh, Kurds force, the uh, Revolutionary Guard, they're the folks who f fought it uh, the most. They shouldn't negotiate, shouldn't do the deal. And, uh, and I thought that that uh, was just disingenuous. And it actually, for me, basically caused me to be, have, put less credence in what, what followed. 
So, uh, Senator, I'm going to interrupt us here just for a moment because a headline just crossed just now saying the U.S. officials now see a missile strike as the likely cause of that Iran crash. That is the 737, the Ukrainian Airlines 737 that crashed. Uh, and now U.S. officials think it was a missile strike. President Trump just suggested that it was not mechanical failure. He did not want to say what it was. You're on Homeland Security. How do you get information and try to sort out exactly what caused that crash over there? Yeah, I, I'm a retired Naval flight officer, retired Navy captain, Vietnam veteran. And uh, you know, I've served in a war where a lot of uh, missiles were fired at, at people. And in this case, I, I, it's just too, too soon to say. We just need to cool our jets and uh, let, uh, let us do, do our homework and find out what happened. I, I we regret the loss of a life of the folks who are on that plane. Apparently, they're from a lot of different countries. That's very, uh, very tragic. Yeah, well said, Senator. Uh, give me one minute on uh, Nancy Pelosi, articles of preachment. The Speaker of the House is not sending them over yet. We're hearing some senators, including some Democratic senators, saying it's high time you get going. People like Barbara Feinstein and things saying, let's send them over. Do you think it's time for her to send them over? Yeah, here, here, I, uh, if you look at the Constitution, the framers of our Constitution came up with a con uh, an impeachment process that sort of mirrors what goes on in criminal proceedings outside of Washington, D.C., outside of the Congress. And what the, uh, what the, the way, as you know, the, the way that criminal justice works, you have an attorney general, you have a prosecutor who gathers evidence, convenes a grand jury, the grand jury in, indicts or they don't indict an indictment. And in, in, in the Congress, it's a very similar situation. The, uh, the grand jury, in this case, is the House of Representatives. The impeachment, uh, indictment in the, in the grand jury is an impeachment here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we have a jury trial. And the idea to say that we can, the House can gather information from witnesses, some cases under oath, if the president will let them testify. But then when they actually have the jury trial, we can't have any new uh, witnesses, we can't have any more information submitted. That's crazy. And I think, uh, God bless Nancy uh, Pelosi, uh, she should hold, uh, stick to her guns until we have mm -hmm. the ability to call relevant witnesses. Chuck mm -hmm. Schumer's not asking for a, a million, I mean, he's asking for four people who mm -hmm. have relevant information. And uh, we, uh, Jefferson used to say that people know the truth, we won't make a, make a mistake. The same is true of Congress, we need to know the truth. Uh, Senator, you are known for your positions on the environment, and President Trump, when he was talking to us from the White House, was actually talking about revisions to the National Environmental Policy Act. Give us your take on those revisions. Are they prudent? As I understand, they would make it possible to move forward more quickly with certain infrastructure projects. Um, I've, I'm on the uh, committee that works on surface transportation, roads, highways, and bridges. I'm a senior Democrat on that, uh, on that committee. Uh, about every five years, we pass major surface transportation legislation in the last... I'd say decade, we have passed some 60 provisions that are designed to streamline, to expedite the movement uh, with uh, appropriate environmental safeguards, but to make it easier to build roads, highways, and bridges. Most of those provisions that we've adopted in law have not been implemented, have not been funded, and are not being done. And uh, before we go around changing the, uh, without a lot of care, uh, the grandfather, the bedrock environmental law, uh, environmental protection law in our country, known as NEPA, uh, we, need to, we need to be careful. At the same time, Senator, I saw some good news. Reports out that, in fact, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States actually declined by 2.1 percent last year, apparently largely because of removal of coal as a source of electricity. Are we making progress? Yeah, there's good news, bad news here. The good news is uh, with respect to uh, carbon emissions from uh, coal-fired plants, coal-fired plants are greatly diminished. I think the emissions down coal-fired plants in the last couple of years about uh, almost 20 percent. That's why the, uh, the overall emi uh, emission picture is down by about 2%. It's mostly all attributable to coal-fired utility plants, which are uh, largely going uh, away. Uh, the, the biggest source of uh, carbon emissions in, uh, in our planet is the vehicles we drive, our cars, trucks, mm -hmm. vans. And what we need is a 50-state deal that uh, reduces, rat ratchets back the emissions of uh, our cars, trucks, and vans beginning in 2021 through 2025. Doesn't do it in a way that, that cripples the auto companies, makes them un uncompetitive, but uh, in a thoughtful, reasonable way. We can do that. This, unfortunately, this administration is not interested in going there. The, if we're going to make serious progress, we need to make a lot more progress in the very near term as well as the longer term. So really serious progress, two best things we can do, continue right. to uh, reduce emissions from utility plants, uh, go after emissions from buildings. Right. Uh, and the other thing, big plan, the big thing is cars, trucks, and cars. Vans. Okay, Senator, thank you so much. That's a really helpful perspective. That's Senator Tom Carper. He's a Democrat from Delaware. Coming at 1 o'clock this afternoon, Eastern Time, we're going to have more on Iran with U.S. officials now saying the Iranian missiles likely downed that Ukraine International Airlines flight in Iran. Former Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff will be joining us on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Back to that breaking news on Iran. U.S. officials now see a missile strike as the likely cause of that plane crash in Iran. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines joins us here now. So one of the first things we ask about is Boeing. Right. Well, Boeing has been up all day because there was kind of already speculation that this was not necessarily the plane maker's fault. You had aviation experts saying that this crash likely wasn't just an engine fire as things didn't really proceed in the way that is common but when those types of crashes. that's coming up after it went down after the crash. After it went down, of course, after the right. crash, because this just added to concerns for Boeing. The last thing Boeing needed was another plane crash on one of its jets. It is still higher by about 2 percent today. Interesting, though, the broader market is actually taking yeah. a bit of a leg lower on this. We're still uh, up on the day by about half a percent on the S&P 500, but we are well off the highs of the session as this may be uh, is seen as throwing a little bit in the dent in the relief rally. If this was indeed Iran shooting down uh, this plane, maybe disrupts that all is calm narrative just a touch. It's not always easy to have an immediate cause and effect between what happens in the world and what happens in the markets. At the same time, the notion that Iran is mistakenly shooting down civilian aircraft is not necessarily good news for the world. I mean, right. if you're flying, if you're transacting business, things like that, that's not necessarily good news. Right, from a risk perspective, and yes. I actually should check on what other airlines uh, are yeah. doing today because, as we know, when these initial Initial um, strikes in Iran were uh, announced. Those airlines really took it on the chin because not only could they be uh, affected by higher oil prices, which obviously isn't the case anymore, but potential retaliation targets. And that's exactly what we're seeing playing out right now. I'm taking a look at the likes of Americans say they are heading down toward the lows of the session. They're not negative by right. any means, but obviously there could be broader implications okay, for us. Big story. Like Thank you so much, Kaylee. Really appreciate it. That's Bloomer's Kaylee Lines. Up next, Liu He is coming back to Washington. China gives its first confirmation of the phase one trade deal signing that's coming up next week. We talk with Libby Cantrell about what we should be expecting no next in our negotiations with China after the president says he's going to start negotiations on phase two immediately, as he puts it. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, U.S. intelligence officials increasingly believe that the Ukrainian jet that fell from the sky after taking off from Tehran on Wednesday was shot down by a missile. Bloomberg has learned the government has obtained evidence that indicates the rapid descent of the Boeing 737 was not caused by a mechanical issue or by pilot error. The Ukraine International Airlines jet plunged from the the sky minutes after takeoff, killing all 176 people aboard. Witnesses say the jetliner was on fire as it fell. The negotiations for the second round of a U.S.-China trade deal will start right away, but President Trump says they might not be finished until after the 2020 election. Mr. Trump spoke at the White House during an event on environmental regulations. China confirmed that it will sign the first phase of the trade deal with the United States next week. Britain is set to pass a major milestone on the road to Brexit today. A bill authorizing the country's departure from the European Union is expected to get final approval from the House of Commons, that despite opposition from smaller parties. The withdrawal agreement bill should become law in time for the UK to leave the EU on the scheduled date of January 31st. In Australia, more residents are being urged to evacuate their homes due to the ongoing wildfires. Hot and windy conditions are expected to escalate the danger over the next two days. Officials say temperatures could soar to more than 110 degrees. The unprecedented fire crisis in the southeastern part of Australia has claimed at least 26 lives since September and destroyed more than 2,000 homes. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Back now to the top story that Mark just mentioned. U.S. officials now see a missile strike as the likely cause of that plane crash in Iran. Bloomberg's national security reporter Bill Ferries joins us now. Bill, I suspect we have more questions than answers, but give us as many answers as we can get. Do we know anything more than what I just said? U.S. officials think it was a missile. 
not really. We did hear President Trump at a news conference just a, a few minutes before that story broke, saying that he had his doubts about the theory that it could have been a mechanical failure. He pointed out that it was, he called it a very rough neighborhood. Uh, obviously, on the night that this plane went down, for whatever reason, that was some of the most heavily watched uh, airspace anywhere in the world, given the attack and the and the U.S. technology to uh, to detect it. So, uh, it it it. Uh, it, it would be an enormous coincidence if, on the night of a strike like that, a plane uh, happened to go down for a mechanical failure. Uh, again, we're still looking for more reporting on this, but that does seem to be the belief among U.S. officials. Yeah, and this is where we get to the questions we don't have answers for. As I understand, they were surface-to-surface -surface missiles that were fired at those two bases uh, in, in Iraq. They were not surface-to-air missiles. So is it likely a surface-to-surface right. -surface missile would take down an aircraft accidentally? No, I, I think the, the, the thinking so far is that it would be a surface-to-air missile that, uh, you know, Iranian defense mechanisms that would have been turned on uh, in case the U.S. somehow uh, launched a response to the um, uh, Iranian attack on the, uh, on the air base in Iraq. So this would have been presumably a precautionary measure by the Iranians that, uh, that could have misfired. Again, this is a lot of speculation yeah. here. All we know at this point is that a lot of U.S. officials uh, think that a missile is a more likely explanation for what happened. It's still a lot more than I knew. So thank you so much to Bloomberg's Bill Ferries reporting now from Washington. And now let's turn from Iran to trade. We're getting more details on the U.S.-China phase one trade deal signing. China announced earlier that Vice Premier Liu He will be traveling to Washington to sign that agreement next week. Meanwhile, President Trump said in the past hour the negotiations on phase two of the deal will start right away. Here with more on what we can expect is Libby Cantrell, head of public policy at PIMCO. Welcome, Libby. Thank you. A lot going on. But let's start with phase one. It now Good. appears they are, in fact, going to sign it the way yep. they said they would. Uh, how much do we know what's in it? I keep, maybe I'm overly obsessed with the 86 pages and not knowing what's in right, the 86 right. pages. Well, and, 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 and presumably we will get more details um, most likely next week. I mean, what we do know is that, you know, and, and a very big focus for the president were these agricultural purchases, these promises to um, make up to 40 to $50 billion of purchases from the United States. This, of course, benefits a big, important constituency for him, the farmers. Um, I think the, the math's going to be hard on those. So, yeah. you know, I that's think that's... That's what people say, that yeah, they're able to yeah. get to that level. And I think our agricultural, our, our commodities traders say the same thing. So that's worth watching for sure. Um, in exchange, we're providing a little bit of relief on tariffs mm -hmm. um, from 15% rate on $110 billion of goods to 7.5%. But still, David, there are tariffs. will still, after this phase one, will still be on $360 billion of imports. I think that's an important thing for the, from an economic perspective to remember and from a markets perspective, that this is by no means a settlement. This is a reprieve and I think arguably a fragile one at that. Which raises a, a big question in my mind at least and we'll have to wait to find out the answer. The president today said he's going to start negotiating phase two right away, but it may be after the election before it gets done. One question in my mind is, do we have to wait for the rest of the tariffs to be relieved until after the final deal is done? Or is this something where maybe he could be ratcheting back in the meantime? Yeah, and I think that's certainly what the Chinese want. I think the Chinese um, certainly are um, hoping that the White House will uh, provide some more tariff relief as these negotiations continue. Um, I'm not sure if we're optimistic about that. I think that the timing around phase two, um, just given... The, you know, the, these the U.S. government officials and Chinese officials have been working on this now for around two years. Um, so, you know, I think morale is relatively low. Uh, I think they're exhausted. And I think, you know, we're not optimistic that we see a phase deal uh, before the election, kind of if, if ever. Well, you know, we'll see. I mean, of yeah. course, those are phase two will presumably address the big structural sticking points that the Chinese have been very reluctant to concede on. And I'm not sure the calculus around, the, uh, around those have changed for the Chinese. Let's talk about the other trade deal that USMCA, the president actually Actually mentioned as well in his remarks today that apparently is being held up until they figure out what they're doing with impeachment in the Senate, yeah. which put pressure to some extent on the Speaker of the House. Nancy Pelosi came out today during her regular press conference and she said she's going to send him over fairly soon. This is what she said. No, I'm not holding him indefinitely. I'll send him over when I'm ready. And that will probably be soon. We want to see what they're willing to do and the manner in which they will do it. 
So not indefinitely, fairly soon, but she wants to see what they're going to do. It's pretty clear she's not going to get to see because Mitch McConnell says, we'll wait till we start the trial, then we'll decide. Right, exactly. Sort of clear as mud, right? Um, yeah, and I think that she's actually getting some pressure, not from House Democrats, but from Senate Democrats to sort of expedite this process because, of course, as you know, you know five of the 14 remaining Democratic co candidates running for the Democratic nomination are in the Senate. And they, of course, want to be in Iowa. They want to be in New Hampshire. They want to be in South Carolina campaigning. They don't want to be uh, sitting in the Senate uh, for for a trial um, for the president, which presumably will just lead to acquittal. So I think we know kind of how this story ends at this point, and I think the Democrats want to you know, see this through. Let's spend a minute on those Democratic candidates, because we had a poll earlier coming out of Iowa saying there's a three-way tie. Monmouth has a poll out today that basically says a four-way tie, including yeah. Elizabeth Warren up there. In the meantime, they're raking in money like I can't believe. Yeah, they've raised, I mean, their their Q4 preliminary numbers look very good. Um, you know, Bernie Sanders, for anybody who kind of counted him out after his heart attack in October, uh, that was certainly misplaced. Uh, the, the thing about this that's interesting, David, um, and from a, from a kind of a policy nerd perspective, this is very exciting because this does increase the chances that we may not actually know the front runner. We may not have a front runner by the time we go in even to the convention in July. Now, um, they've said that before in previous election cycles, but because this is sort of a four-way tie because these candidates are running, raising so much money, uh, and because of course Bloomberg has indefinite resources. You know, presumably this could last quite a while. Um, interestingly, by March 17th, from a market's perspective, that's what you know folks should be looking at. March 17th, 70 percent of the pledge delegates will be allocated. So if we don't have a clear front runner by then, then again the chances of broker convention in July increase significantly. As far as you can tell, does this make it particularly difficult for the former Vice President Joe Biden because his plan? Was basically get out in front, stay out in front, just be the prohibitive favorite. And it looks like that might not happen now. Well, look, I mean, to, to Joe, to Vice President Biden's credit, I mean, his polling's been a lot more yes. durable than I think a lot of people thought, um, especially after, you know, maybe some lackluster appearances and mm -hmm. performances in the debate. So, um, sure, is this sort of against plan? But again, I mean, I think you have to look at his polling. He's been the lead front runner, he's been the front runner, you know, pretty consistently, uh, and that doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. Libby, it's always great to have you here. Thank Thanks you so much. much. That's Libby Cantrell. She's head of public policy at PIMCO. And a disclaimer, Michael R. Bloomberg is the founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP. That's the parent company of Bloomberg News. Coming up, the world is breathing a sigh of relief after the United States and Iran have apparently stepped back from their confrontation. But will it last? And is there a way forward? We talk with Iran expert Hillary Mann Leverett of Stratega. That's next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Breaking in the past hour, news that U.S. officials now believe an Iranian missile caused the crash of that Ukraine International Airlines flight over in Tehran. Welcome now an authority on Iran, Hillary Mann Leverett, Stratega CEO, a political risk consultancy. Dr. Mann Leverett was National Security Council Director for Afghanistan, Iran, and the Persian Gulf in the days following 9-11, where she negotiated directly with the Iranian regime. She comes to us today from Washington. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Leverett. Good to have you with us. Uh, give us a sense of a reaction to this news because initially when the airliner crashed Iran quickly came out and said it was mechanical failure now it appears maybe that it was actually uh, Iranian perhaps defensive missiles that shot it down by accident what does that do to the regime in Tehran well, it, it potentially could be pretty damaging. There was an Iranian civil airliner that was shot down accidentally by U.S. forces uh, back in 1988. That is something seen as incredibly significant in Iran and the Iranian narrative of its suffering. So if they've now shot down an, a civilian airliner, it would be damaging in particular to their narrative, their ability to uh, talk to their people about the suffering in their history. But I wouldn't rush to judgment here. There's a lot going on, and it just shows, I think, the incredibly high nature of risk in the region that is brought about by this heightened U.S.-Iran tension. Yeah, no question about that. But give us a sense, insofar as we have any guesses about it, what the process is by which we might find out the answer to the question. Uh, as I understand it, initially Iran was saying maybe they'd like assistance, including for the United States. The United States was saying maybe we can't because of sanctions. Uh, right. What is the process? Who's going to figure out the answer? 
Well, Iran itself does have a, a sophisticated bureaucracy and apparatus that deals with airline safety. They've had to build up one indigenously because of U.S. sanctions. We, the United States has essentially blocked the uh, Iranians from participating in many international safe, uh, airline safety organizations and, of course, working directly with the United States. So I think first the Iranians will try to work on this themselves. They will probably elicit the support and cooperation of not only Ukraine but other countries nearby, probably even the Russians, before they turn, uh, turn to the United States. There's a third party involved here, and that's Canada, because Canada yes. had a lot of, uh, of its citizens on that plane. They may have something yes. to say about who's going to look at this. Well, they certainly will want to have something to say about it, but this is where the Iranians get very defensive. They want to have control over decisions taken in and about their own territory. So I think they will first and foremost try to reach out to those that are going to be uh, seen as more aligned with Iranian interests, in particularly the Russians, who have a lot of experience in this area. So, so yesterday, doctor, we heard President mm -hmm. Trump say that he believes that Iran is standing down, I think was the term he used in the confrontation yes. in the United States. Do you read it the same way? And if so, how do they do that? I'm, I don't read it the same way. I think it's a bit of wishful thinking. And I think for right now, President Trump uh, has gotten lucky and he should enjoy he should enjoy this time. I've you know, negotiated with the Iranians since 9-11, and I came to know the current Iranian foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, well during that negotiation and really for the past nearly 20 years in various what we call track two diplomatic efforts to resolve differences between the U.S. and Iran. This is the most acrimonious time that I have seen in more than 20 years. Even someone like Foreign Minister Zarif, who has always looked for a diplomatic path forward, who has always looked to negotiate, he is not looking to do that now. He thinks the possibility of real negotiations with the United States has all but collapsed. I think we're, we're in for the next at least six months, if not year up until the election campaign here in the United States, a really a slow boil of tension uh, between the U.S. and Iran that could explode in some unpredictable ways. To put it bluntly, can Iran afford that? What's going on with their economy with the sanctions in place? Well, in part because of that, they can't afford the status quo. I think that's what many people uh, don't understand. The sanctions have been crippling. They are debilitating inside Iran. And for some time, since May 2018, when Trump pulled the United States out of the Iran nuclear deal and started to reimpose sanctions, Iranians across the political board there have coalesced around the idea that the status quo is not sustainable. So we've seen an increased range of provocations from Iran. This was not the first one that culminated with the killing of General Soleimani. The Iranians are, were likely behind the, uh, the September 14th attacks on the Saudi oil, uh, overland oil infrastructure uh, in Saudi Arabia. The Iranians were responsible for shooting down the, Iran the American drone at the end of June. So it has been seen as unsustainable, and I think the Iranians are going to continue to try to push until they achieve their goal, which is the expulsion of U.S. troops from the region and perhaps even bringing down President Trump, as they think they brought down President Carter back in 1980. So that's bringing down President Trump. What about bringing down the regime over in Iran? Before all of this happened, the attack on Soleimani, uh, there were demonstrations in Iran. There were reports that uh, hundreds, maybe even thousands, were killed mm -hmm. as a result of how solid is the Ayatollah Khamenei? Well, in part, what this killing of Soleimani has done is it has brought about a tremendous political uh, consolidation inside Iran and within the region for Iran. There were not only uh, divisions within Iran, but there were divisions in Iraq. There, were, there was anti-Iran sentiment uh, really exploding into the headlines in Iraq. But today, it's really consolidated. There is a, a rally around the flag effect that we have seen with millions of people turning out in Iran to commemorate uh, the death or to mourn the death of General Soleimani, and in Iraq as well to mourn the death not only of Iran's General Soleimani, but the, of, of the Iraqi fighters that were killed in that same hit. So we're seeing this political consolidation really backfire, perhaps, in terms of what President Trump wanted, with more support for the government in Iran and for uh, Iran inside Iraq as well. Hillary Mann Leverett, Stratega CEO, will be staying with us. President Trump said today he still wants to have negotiations. We're going to talk with Dr. Mann about whether that's really possible. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We are back now with Hillary Mann Leverett of Stratega, the CEO there. So one of the things we heard from President Trump yesterday and then again today was he would like a diplomatic, a negotiated settlement to all of this with Iran. Is there any prospect of that? Can you see any path that we can get there? I think it would be very difficult. The Iranians now don't, they don't trust the words of President Trump or the U.S. government. It's not even so much the killing of General Soleimani. It was Trump's abrogation of the Iran nuclear deal uh, negotiated, in, negotiated by President Obama. If Trump could not uphold a prior agreement of the U.S. government, why should Iran trust uh, President Trump? The only way I potentially see forward is if there were if there was some action, not just words, but some action. And the two areas that the Iranians are looking for are the lifting of U.S. sanctions, and the second is the the removal of U.S. troops from the region. Now, while both of those seem very far off, there are potentially two doors that could open slightly in each area. One is over the the crash of this Ukrainian airliner. If the United States were lift to lift sanctions, at least enough to allow Boeing to go in to to work with Iran to to deal with this crash and perhaps even to um, to expand that relationship a bit. That's possibly a small door that could go forward. The other also seems a bit unlikely, but is is been opened by President Trump, is the removal of U.S. troops. President Trump has long wanted to remove U.S. troops from the Middle East. He campaigned on this in 2016, and it looked like that was going to be a major talking point in his campaign this year. What he's saying today is that he would rather NATO troops be in the Middle East rather than U.S. troops. Now, Iran is not so interested in NATO troops, but if they could get the president to move from the idea of removing U.S. troops and replacing them with NATO troops to just removing U.S. troops, at least there's a path there. Now, while both of those seem unlikely and seem a bit odd, I've, I've dealt with the Iranians for nearly 20 years and their foreign minister. He has a Ph.D. in international law from an American university. He understands the American dynamic, the politics, the rhetoric, the vernacular here, and perhaps he can see a way to work with that. We're talking with it's Hillary. a bit of wishful thinking, but that's, that's the only path I see. Sorry, doctor. We're talking with Hillary Mann Leverett of Stratega. Uh, one of the possibilities that President Trump held out yesterday was, I'll call it JCPOA 2.0. That in fact, we need the UK, Germany, maybe Russia, maybe even China to join with us to get Iran back to the negotiating table in order to have a new approach that would cover some of the things he's concerned about. And maybe we could get a relief of sanctions that way. We talked with Michael O'Hanlon from Brookings Institution yesterday. This is what he said about that idea. Well, there is a prospect in theory, but I'm not sure the Trump administration can really be the one to do it because, first of all, of course, they've lost uh, credibility as, a, you know, sort of multilateral player on this issue. So, Doctor, what about it? Maybe not the United States taking the lead, but could we get Germany, for example, or the U.K. to take the lead here and actually get a bigger deal done with JCPOA that would satisfy both the regime in Iran because we'd get a reduction of sanctions or elimination and President Trump because we'd address things like missiles? Well, the Europeans w would love to do this. But from what I understand, even though President Trump put this out there, there there's not a, a lot of reality beyond underneath it and, and holding it up. Because what Tra President Trump is really looking for, and this is important because it's not, it's, uh, it, it's not without some legitimacy, what he is looking for is a bilateral deal between the United States and Iran that allows U.S. business to benefit from any deal with Iran. One of the major problems he had with the JCPOA, when you take off all the vitriolic rhetoric around uh, his complaints about it, his core concern was it did nothing for the United States, nothing for U.S. Mm -hmm. Companies. It allowed the Europeans, the Japanese, to all go in and go in and make lots of deals, but not a thing for U.S. companies. So my understanding is that he continues to be very focused on the po on the potential for a U.S.-Iran deal. I'm not sure he's going to get it this way. And, and finally, Doctor, uh, you mentioned more than once the possibility that Iran would want to somehow dislodge President Trump maybe in the election year coming up. Yes. Do they have the capability to do things, including on U.S. soil, that could really interfere with the election here? Well, there are a few tracks that, that Iran proceeds on at the same time. One is direct military, uh, what they would call direct military retaliation, which they've done. They've shown their capacity to do that with their missile strikes on these bases in Iraq that house U.S. troops. But where Iran has really excelled for 40 years is in asymmetric warfare. And it's not necessarily the military 
part of asymmetric warfare. There's the psychological aspect. The way they dislodged Carter was they forced Car President Carter back in 1980 to misstep during the, during the hostage crisis. They see their capacity there as well. Mm -hmm. That President Trump, they think right. they can force him to misstep. They can, what the, one of them said to me, they can put right. him in the slow boil of incompetence. Right. and have him come down in November. Okay, doctor, thank you so very much. It was really terrific having you with us. That's Hillary thank Mann you. Leverett, Stratega CEO. Coming up at 1 o'clock this afternoon Eastern Time, we're going to have more on Iran with Michael Chertoff, former U.S. Homeland Security Secretary. Coming up tomorrow, I'm going to be hosting a new program for Bloomberg Television, radio and digital, Bloomberg Wall Street Week. We'll bring back an icon of business television, originally hosted by Louis Ruckheiser. We'll bring you the most important stories of the week, stories that affect Wall Street and the world, with a regular panel of thought leaders. This week, it will be Larry Summers, former Secretary of Treasury, and Roger Ferguson, CEO of TIAA, talking about the events of the week. Our panel will be joined by Michelle Flournoy. She's former undersecretary Secretary of Defense for policy at, for, on the U.S. confrontation with Iran. That's going to come up at 6 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Bloomberg.